Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Pottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today we welcome research scientist Dr. Ryan Schmid and student scientist Tia Buzanitz, both from the Ecdysis Foundation. Ryan leads the foundation's rangeland studies, and his current research focuses on how regenerative grazing affects pollinators and dung anthropod communities, and how anthropods facilitate the cycling of nutrients in grasslands. Tia's current research is focused on honeybee health and hive management, as well as land management effects on pollinator conservation and survival. So listen in as Monty discusses with Ryan and Tia all things pollinators, pasture, and poop. Welcome everyone to this edition of the Ag Emerge podcast. I'm very excited to be talking to a couple great uh, researchers today associated with the Ecdysis Foundation and We're going to have a little fun with the title of this one. We're calling it Everything from Poop to Pollinators. So welcome, Ryan and Tia. I'm glad you could join us today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Oh, that is wonderful. So tell us a little bit, remind everyone, we've we've had some other folks from the Ecdysis Foundation and Blue Dasher Farm on the podcast. Just uh, give us a little overview, Ryan, of what uh, Ecdysis is all about and what is the research that you guys are doing there uh, just north of Brookings in South Dakota. Sure. Uh, yeah, Exisis Foundation. So we're a, we're a small nonprofit. Uh, I've been around for about five years now, and it started with my our founder, uh, John Jonathan Lundgren. Um, started Exisis because he was an ARS USDA ARS scientist, and he wanted to pursue some research that that uh, he thought would have more of an impact on the land, and he wasn't. Uh, satisfied with what the USDA was allowing him to do. So he broke away and started Ecdysis a few years ago and really pursued, you know, what now is known as regenerative agriculture. At that time, we weren't really calling it regenerative agriculture. Just didn't have that cool name then, did it? Yeah, yeah. Now it's got the buzzword and everyone knows it. Yeah, it's, you see it everywhere. <laughs> So what does Ecdysis, the word, mean itself? This is, uh, okay, for... Um, the, the entomologist community, you, you know, we love you guys. You're a little quirky. Okay. That's, <laughs> I, you gotta be a little quirky to work with, you know, multiple legged critters on a regular basis. What does the word ecdysis mean? And that, that applies to your, the foundation. Sure. Yeah, I, actually, thanks for the compliment. We don't mind being called quirky. <laughs> um, cause we are, uh, but ecdysis means it's, it's in the, the shedding of the old skin. So when in, as insects grow, they, you know, going from their larval to their adult forms, they're shedding their skins uh, in order to grow. And ecdysis is that last shedding of the old skin to become the new, you know, phase of their life. So a pretty powerful metaphor. And uh, that's, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. So tell us a little bit about uh, your different areas of focus there at ecdysis. Tia, I'll start with you. Uh, talk about what what you're doing there and and how you how you came to uh, the organization and and what are some of the discovery research things that you're doing right now? Yeah, um, so I work in the honeybees. We are a honey farm and we produce honey and sell it for our customers. Um, I started out here. I had never worked in a beehive before. Um, John kind of just threw me in there and he said, "All right, put these gloves on. We're gonna go open up the hives and look around." And that was my first time ever working with the hives. Um, And since then I've started adopting, you know, I've been um, running one or two projects per summer. Um, So I've run a couple of studies. We did one where we were supplementing the honeybees with um, ascorbic acid or vitamin C. Uh, We ran that study for two years. We did another one where I actually tried essential oils uh, because there was a little bit of a buzz about essential oils prop possibly helping with varroa mite, uh, one of their parasites. So I ran a little study about that um, more recently for my master's degree. 
I've been researching probiotics, uh, see if that'll help the survival of the hives and um, see if that can, we can work in some probiotic supplements. So that's interesting. All of those things are, are good. So if it's a negative answer or a positive answer, either way, we've, we've learned more, right? So what are some of the things you learned through those, those three things with the, the vitamin C, ascorbic acid and uh, probiotics, and then also with the essential oils? Um, so far, like you said, if it's good or bad, either way, we're getting answers, you know? Um, so far, we haven't had real answers. <laughs> it's sort of been um, um, statistically insignificant across the board. Okay. Um, so I'm hoping maybe this year we'll start seeing some results with our rangeland study, which is what we're here to talk about today. So <laughs> right. I'm excited to actually have something that's going to help the bees. Well, that's interesting. So what you're saying is when we look at it, the, the typical, uh, you know, humankind approach is let's see if we can find that silver bullet that's going to solve all our problems, right? So uh, can vitamin C solve all our problems? Can a probiotic where what you're saying with this rangeland approach is maybe it's the fact of the total diet and the diversity of that diet improving the uh, natural resistance to varroa mite within the hive. So it's not only maybe the activities, not only maybe the, the immune response or, or resistance to it in the bee itself, but maybe how the, the, the comb formation or, or activities within the um, beehive are, are modified as a result of the dietary intake. Is that, I'm sorry. I yeah. Ran yeah. Off, is that I, what I think you I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't think we're going to end up finding that silver bullet as a management practice. So I don't know if there's going to be something that you can feed them and they'll suddenly be healthy and not die, you know. Right. Um, so and I think this is really our answer is just an ecosystem level approach to keeping the bees healthy, you know. So yeah. um, so far, what I what I believe is that putting them on a better ecosystem is going to substantially increase their health compared to just trying to meddle with their diet and do really small incremental management changes versus, you know, large scale um, ecosystem changes. Correct. And now, how do we, um, when, when we're looking at those ecosystem changes, how does it apply within the context of what happens with the honeybee? So, you know, a great majority of honeybees, well, let me back up before I get there. How, how what kind of progress have we made with colony collapse and varroa mite in the last 10 years? Has there been progress? Or are we just accepting, you know, the 35% high failure level or whatever the percentage is? Um, so from where I am, it looks like there hasn't been progress. <laughs> I just watched a documentary and um, it was from, you know, 2008 when colony collapse disorder was suddenly in the limelight and everyone was talking about it. And I was just sitting there thinking about how nothing has really changed, <laughs> you know, it was really disappointing. Um, but so I do have some figures here. According to um, the Bee Informed Partnership, about 45% of managed colonies were lost in 2020 to 2021. Um, so this is a really significant number. This is reporting from hobbyist beekeepers as well as a few commercials. So um, it's sort of across the board about 45%. So we're kind of going up in losses. So this is just you know, ah, no big deal. Just go ahead and increase your colony count by 45% to cover for it. Right. And, and life goes on or what, what, yeah, is, I mean, what is the I, I guess we're just going to have to keep buying more bees, right. <laughs> Unless we can fix this problem. So at least, at least that is an option, right? I mean, obviously it, it dramatically increases costs, but um, that unfortunately that's been our answer to these issues up to this point. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So it just, we've doubled the cost of honeybees to the, to the farmer that's using them for pollination. So your, your whole goal is to say, what, what is causing this problem? Or maybe not what's causing this problem, but how do we remediate the problem? Is that, is that a fair way to say that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have a few ideas for what's causing this problem. And um, right now the consensus is sort of just that it's a bunch of different compounding factors. So if we had one thing that was we knew for sure was the problem, maybe we could take it out, you know, and deal with that thing. But um, right now we're just trying to figure out how to mitigate this and how to keep the bees alive. <laughs> right. And one of the things about doing it with rangeland is the top two or three things 
that are likely on the suspected list are not present in rangeland, correct? Yes. So I would say number one thing is my least favorite chemistry, neonic. Number two thing is a great tool, but unfortunately great side effects is glyphosate. And what, what would maybe be some of the other contributing factors there, Tia? Well, um, something great about rangelands is that they're not tilled. Um, ah, there you go. Yeah, so you have more fungal dominant soil species. Yeah, you've got, you've got a, a great um, biodiversity there if you don't till. And then that also really helps our native pollinators because about 70% of those are um, ground nesting. So if you think about, you know, we're not disrupting their homes, we've got, um, we've got more of a habitat for native pollinators. So this doesn't just apply to honeybees. Um, another great thing about rangelands is that they have the capacity to have more um, sort of plant biodiversity, right? So we're not just using it as a cropland. So we're not just planting soybeans out there. We can have more than one plant out on the rangelands. And so that's a big part of our study is looking at this plant and floral biodiversity and um, seeing how that plays into the pollinators. So at the end of the day, and I'll, I'll leave this question open to either one of you, Ryan or Tia, at the end of the day, uh, almonds are what drives the honeybee market. I mean, 90, 95% of the bees go to California to pollinate the almonds. And uh, it, it's almond nectar is poor <laughs> for, for bees. I mean, it's, it's not great in nutritional diversity, energy content. It's really hard on them. So they come there with, you know, high vitality, hives and leave needing some recovery time. Um, how does this rangeland fit into this great migration that we have of honeybees around the country? Because essentially that's why we have honeybees is for the economic return. Otherwise they're, they're really not native to our environment. They're European. <laughs> so we're taking a short break to share that the Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by the team at Ag Solutions Network. Rooted in innovation, ASN is committed to leaving the land better than we found it, not simply maintaining it. We're here to help you navigate the balancing act of productivity and building a legacy. From practices to products, ASN is more than a new jug. It's a new way of thinking. So don't be afraid to be different. Be afraid to be the same. Contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. And now back to our show. How does this rangeland fit into the pollination protocol and how they move around the country? I don't yeah, know if so, everyone wants it. Go ahead, Ryan. I was just going to say, it, you, you made a good point there. You know, the, the almond, traveling to the almond orchards and feeding on that low quality nectar is hard on those bees. So uh, that, that takes place over the course of, you know, like a month, month and a half or so. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do with the bees the rest of the year? You got to put them somewhere. And so a lot of folks, you know, they, they move them back to their home territory and a big part of the country's bees actually come back to the Northern Plains in the summertime. You know, historically this was, at least here in Eastern South Dakota, this was used for summering the bees because there was so much sweet clover in the area. Mm. Um, and, and that was a, a big resource. And, and there was a lot more pastures and rangelands because as you move up into South Dakota and further west and then go up into North Dakota, uh, you get a lot less agriculture because the, the, there's just not a climate to support a lot of corn and soy production. It's more small grains and there's more rangelands and you see all these, these other habitats for our bees as well. Um, so that's a big component of why rangelands are important for our honeybees. Uh, you gotta so, do something so with them the rest of the year making sure we've got a good 10 month off season so that we're ready, ready for the, for game day, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good. What do you, what do you see as far as, and we'll get into, uh, we'll get into the poop part of our, our podcast here shortly, but uh, uh, on the P bees, there's a lot of uh, hope in California to have uh, cover crops that can be pollinating at the same time as the trees are. Uh, there's some challenges with that as far as establishment, timing and GDU timing of the uh, cover crops to be able to bloom at the same time. In other words, for an annual, it's, we found it to be impossible to be um, uh, consistently blooming at almond time. 
Um, have you, have you guys run across that same thing so far, as far as having bloom early enough in almonds to support some diversity for those bees? I actually don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah. I haven't worked too much with the cover crop, uh, in the, in the almond orchards actually. Um, okay. No we, problem. We That's fine. It's one yeah. thing we're trying to do is establish cover crops to give them some diversity. You know, mm -hmm. at first everybody's like, oh, you don't want that because the bees are going to be busy pollinating the cover crops instead of mm -hmm. our trees. And then, you know, mm -hmm. farmers have progressed beyond that point. Uh, our biggest thing is one year we can get them to bloom and then two years we can't. Uh, so there's I, a, there's also, you know, just to mention, uh, there's extra floral nectaries on some of the cover crops that, that people like to plant, such as uh, hairy vetch and fava beans, uh, sunflowers. You know, the extra floral nectaries, uh, just to explain that a little bit, it, it's like this, this little sugar packet that the plants produce. They, they're like these little tiny leaves that come out when there's a big branch off the main stalk. And you'll see a little black dot on those little leaves and it's sugar water. And there's uh, some cover crop species that are commonly planted that produce those as well uh, when they're not blooming. That is excellent. Uh, we need to follow up on that because that's an opportunity there. So, yeah. And just to note, we actually were in a field looking at some hives in New Zealand and we had some farmers that approached us and said, all the bees are coming to my field over here. Why is that? And he had planted hairy vetch. And what we found, the bees were coming to his field onto those extra floral nectar. So it actually, they do come to it. Uh, it's a great resource for them. We've seen it. Yeah. Correct. Well, wow, that's interesting. Uh, is that just on hairy vetch or other vetch varieties? Do you, do you know? I don't think all veg varieties have it. I know for sure hairy veg does, but I'd, I'd have to do some deeper digging to know which other ones might. All right. Sounds like we'll be doing that after the podcast here. Yeah. But uh, no, that's, that's interesting because the more that we can provide some diversity in season with almonds, and for those of you that don't grow almonds, the you know, odd part about almonds is, is that they bloom you know, really early in the season, um, and there's, there's very little other bloom of anything going on in the Central Valley of California at the time. So, you know, the bees are placed there and, and, and go to work and, and there's just a limited diet. You know, you can have steak every day, but if you had steak three meals a day for, for two months in a row, you'd get a little tired of it, right? You'd have some deficiencies. So, yeah, and it's could, not, um, not even steak. That, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So another thing I'd like to say about that is um, these understory cover crops for almonds um, I think we start, we need to start thinking about honeybees kind of more as a supplement to pollination. So the natives really are really important here if we're going to try to focus on conservation. Um, and so having these crops, whether or not they're blooming early in the year, we're, we're still providing a little bit more of a um, habitat for these native bees. And those are still going to come in and do a lot of your pollination for you. That's a great point. Plus, we've also documented in several instances where we have improved uh, pest control because, you know, predator mites are hosted inside of the cover crops and take care of the, uh, you know, pest mites that we have. And so, yeah, there's, there's lots of opportunities there. Yeah. Ryan, I wanted to dive in a little bit uh, on, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about pollinators. So now we need to talk about the poop. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks to uh, a certain group of, of insects that are, that are out there, uh, if they didn't exist, this world would be covered in poop, right? Because it don't <laughs> exactly. just actually go away on its own. Um, now, there are several reasons why we think, uh, you know, several maybe uh, areas are full of crap, but <laughs> this literally <laughs> would be a problem if uh, we had, if we didn't have uh, dung beetles and other, uh, you know, surface insects that can take manure and, and incorporate it into the soil. Talk to us about those processes and, and what you're doing there, Ryan, and, and how all this works and the, the beauty of, of this connection in, in the natural design between, you know, insects and, and herbivores. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, I'm sure some of your listeners today were thinking, how, what the heck does poop have to do with pollinators? Well, um, it's actually really important. Uh, and, and you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, there is a beautiful system happening in our rangelands right now. And I like to think of a farmer or a rancher that's managing those rangelands as essentially just a nutrient 
cycling manager. That's that's maybe what you should be thinking of yourself as your primary job out there. And like you said, there is a lot of poop and a lot of pee that our livestock produces every day. Uh, I ran some numbers. This was a few years ago, uh, back when our cattle herd in the U.S. was 94 and a half million. But if we didn't deal with that poop that was produced, we could literally be covered in it. Uh, for instance, when I ran the numbers, it would essentially cover the state of Massachusetts every year. Uh, and if you think of that as maybe a better way to think of it is if you look at lost grazing potential, a cow will will avoid five times the area of a cow pat. You know, she doesn't want to eat things that are soil. And uh, when you multiply that area times five in terms of avoided pastures that we're losing every year, it's about the size of Arkansas. So this is really important. And, and when you look at a cow pat, a cow pat is has all these macronutrients for our plants out there that are growing to feed the cows. And if we didn't break those cow pats down, we, you know, there's about two and a half percent, four percent nitrogen, two and a half, two and a half percent potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, sodium. Uh, there's all these great nutrients out there. And if you are not getting those cow pats broken down quickly, you're losing a lot of um, it's oxidizing into the air and you're losing a lot of those nutrients. And what you alluded to is the arthropods are actually really, really important for opening up those cow pads and beginning the process of breaking it down and incorporating it into the soil. Uh, so that's why as a nutrient manager of your rangelands, you care about arthropod diversity. The big one that everybody likes to talk about is the dung beetles. And, and folks, you know, I'm sure your listeners know, dung beetles are really important because they break it down, but they also uh, open up cow pats for other arth arthropods, earthworms, microbes, fungi to get in there as well and start breaking that down and incorporating it into the soil. Think of them as the tunnel builders for a lot of these other um, critters that increase the surface area so you can get more things in there and break it down more quickly. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so when they do that, we see we've run studies here in the Northern Plains uh, and we've been on farms in the Southeastern US and we see a significantly quicker breakdown of dung pats in pastures. So that chunk of Massachusetts, if we didn't have dung beetles, or if you have good dung beetles, we can recycle that much more quickly, significantly more quickly. Uh, and then once you get it into the soil, you know, obviously you have all these nutrients available, you're feeding microbes and fungi in your soil that feed our plants that grow more biomass. And that's what we found out in the pastures that we've studied that re manage them in a regenerative way. They have more plant biomass. And also another interesting thing, they have more plant diversity we found. And that's how it linked, it got us thinking, well, are these regenerative pastures a great resource for our honeybees and other pollinators uh, in the summertime here in the Northern Plains, uh, all throughout the year in the Southern part of the US, uh, you know, they're, they're providing a much more diverse rangeland with more forbs and flowering plants out there. So that's kind of how our poop links to pollinators. That's a bit of a long tail, but that's, that's how we got there. Well, I, I, it isn't a long, that's how it was designed, right? Yeah. So we need to, to think about that a little bit. And it's, it's interesting uh, the role of arthropods and, and what they do with the cow pats. And like you said, the quicker we can incorporate that into the soil, uh, the more bioavailable nutrients we have. So when it exits the cow, uh, extraordinarily bioavailable, uh, uh, it's a, a wonderful microbial soup. There's live, you know, bacteria in there. There's even some fungi that exist in there mm -hmm. and uh, it's pH balanced, uh, smells wonderful when you don't <laughs> trade it in a feedlot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it actually isn't a bad smell at all. And, and the, the other thing is, is it's, it's, um, 
there, there's, there's even simple saccharides in there. There's proteins in addition to all the nutrients that you have. And like you said, it's bioavailable. So the quicker we can convert that into the soil, the better. And like mm-hmm. you said, you know, uh, the cow pat doesn't move on its own, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it stays right where it falls. So yeah. unless we have uh, arthropods at work, distributing it throughout the soil, uh, we have an extraordinarily high nutrient concentration that's not good for anything, right? You know, it's uh, toxic levels in that immediate zone. But like, if you can, you know, distribute it within a three to five foot circle around there, now we have uh, done a great job of improving the nutrient availability there to, like you said, more biomass from what you're documenting and more diversity. Because when you have diversity, of plants uh, decreases as nutrient concentrate concentrations increase, right? Because not mm-hmm. some plants just can't handle that that high level. Is that mm-hmm. what's going on there in your, in your observations because of the distribution fact of the insects? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, uh, plants can only utilize so many. They only need so many macro macronutrients. You know, Liebberg's law, the minimum. They, there's a minimum thing that they, you know, that they need. That, Ryan's so, law, the maximum. We're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, but you're exactly <laughs> right. Uh huh. Yeah. So there, it doesn't make sense to concentrate it all for one plant. You know, let's distribute that out a little better. Mm-hmm. And this regenerative style of grazing, uh, I think, maybe a point that needs to be made is. It, it it usually is a mob style grazing where you have higher stocking densities of land, you know, concentrated into an area and then moved, and then that land is allowed to rest. But you're concentrating that that dung in that area, but it's evenly distributed, mm-hmm. and it's putting it at a concentration or an amount that uh, the land can can kind of handle. Mm-hmm. I would say it, it's not being concentrated over and over and over for the entire grazing season, you know, around the watering hole or the mineral feeder or the salt lick. Uh, it's moving throughout the pasture and then the plants are, are, are allowed to, to utilize that. So like you said, uh, dung beetles get all the, all the fame and glory and, you know, all, they are the, the rock stars, right? But they've got lots of supporting critters down there. How many different species are we talking about that support this um, uh, redistribution and, you know, the bioturbidity and and all of these essential functions to turn a cow pat back into uh, and distribute it for rangeland use? How, how, How many hundreds, if not thousands of species are involved? Yeah, uh, that's a kind of a fun question. So uh, there's a review article out there that says in North America, there's about 450 species associated with dung. Uh, In our study, uh, I just totaled up the numbers from 2019, where we looked at 20 uh, ranches here in Eastern South Dakota and Central North Dakota. And we found 553 species. So in our dung pads. Um, So there's a lot and it's, you know, dung beetles are the rock stars. Now they get all the press, but there's a whole community of things that are going on out there. There's parasitoid wasps that come in after the dung beetles open up those pats Mm -hmm. and they come in um, and sting maggots, you know, fly maggots that are pests. Your your fly problem. Yep. Yep. They start to control your flies. There's predatory beetles like Staphylinidae beetles. That's the family. Uh, uh, Rove beetles is the common name. They're long, skinny guys, and they use those tunnels that the that the uh, um, dung beetles use too to go in there, and they predate, they eat the maggots as well. Uh, there's also a lot of folks are surprised to learn there's three different kinds or guilds of flies out there. They're not all pest flies. Uh, there's actually some predatory ones as well, where they're predatory in the maggot stage. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on out there. And it really behooves us to support that community and increase that diversity as much as we can, uh, because that's what helps to control our pests. Behooves like a cow. Yeah, (laughs) good pun. (laughs) (laughs) So 553 different species. First off, you've got really good eyes. 
<laughs> you have a tremendous amount of patience or you have a whole lot of grad students helping you or all of the above. I mean, how, what is that like to, to do that? I mean, how in the world do you do that? Uh, I am mostly, the main reason we can do that is we have a tremendous amount of graduate and other technical help here at the lab. Uh, we have a full-time insect taxonomist that does nothing but IDs all the insects I pull out of poop for me. Uh, he's fantastic. We have a team of technicians that sit there and they go through um, cow pies and pick out all the arthropods and we get them cleaned up before we send them to the taxonomist. Um, which actually, this your listeners might be interested in this. If they're interested <laughs> in learning about what's in their cow pies and what sort of diversity maybe they have, uh, a really quick and simple way to check that without having to dig through themselves, you know, get their, get their hands too dirty, is to just take a five gallon bucket with some water and pick up a cow pie. You want to pick one up that's like two to five days old. That's when there's the greatest amount of diversity. Throw it in the bucket. The debris, the heavy sediment and stuff tends to fall to the bottom. And the insects usually will float for a certain period of time. And then you can kind of see if you're having trouble seeing that, uh, if the insects are all falling down, you can add a little bit of salt to it. That's actually one of the tricks we'll use too. So add a little salt, it increases the buoyancy, the insects will float better. Mm -hmm. So if you want like a two to three day old cow pie, you're just looking for that crust, right? You go out there and you knock <laughs> on it. And it's got like a little bit of crust on the outside and it's still soft and gooey on the inside. It's like a chocolate chip cookie, right? Like. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. There we go. <laughs> Just don't eat it like a chocolate chip cookie or dip it in milk. So Gia, you got really too excited about that. I'm a little worried. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, Ryan's had me doing this out in the field for him. Yeah. We'll go out with shovels and we're just scooping up fresh pies and, oh, we got a good one over here. And everyone gets all excited and we run over and yeah, we, we get pretty excited about them. And do you notice a, a change as the uh, cattle's diet varies throughout the season as they get lusher grass and, you know, those less fun cow buys to probably collect or, uh, cow splats, uh, versus, you know, high fiber diets where we have really stacked up. Do you notice the insect populations and diversity shifting throughout that season as the grasses shift? Uh, I guess I've never looked at it from the, you know, in terms of the consistency of the cow pie, but I, I would say this. Uh, so a lot of our dung beetles uh, are what they're feeding on, at least as adults, is a liquid diet. So if it gets too dry out there, they don't. I mean, they can still live on it, but it's not as good for them. They're they're feeding on you know the water and the fungi and bacteria. You know that's that's what they're feeding on. And it's easier to make a ball out of something that has some moisture to it versus something that's stacked yeah. high so that's... yeah so i've never looked at it but more you know they need some moisture out there and then our dung beetle population they shift throughout the summer you know some species are active only in the spring and some are kind of in the middle and some are at the end so you know, that's just a natural occurrence according to their life cycles yeah so I, I gotta, I gotta give you guys a hard time because here you are supporting insects and all this stuff. Then you're telling us, Hey, go out there, grab their home, throw it in a bucket, drown them. And just to drown them better, put salt in it to where you can, <laughs> I mean, that is torture. I can't believe <laughs> you're doing this, but no, it, it's interesting. This technique, we do the same thing for corn rootworm, uh, scouting, uh, oh, sure. you know, dig a corn root ball. I put it in a uh, water bucket and then, yeah, we put the salt in there. I always thought it was just to annoy them. Cause they do, <laughs> they do wiggle more when you put the salt in there, but I, the buoyancy sure. would make sense. Uh, but that's how we do. Well, when we used to do crop scouting, now we just plant, you know, rootworm corn and hope it works, but uh, <laughs> I'm weird. I do non GMO and we still dig corn plants and check for larva, but uh, um, it's, it's interesting that that technique. So I, guys, you shouldn't be recommending killing bugs. I tell you. <laughs> So what are some of the things we're doing as ranchers uh, that are going to dramatically affect um, what is going on biodiversity wise? And if there's one reason uh, to not, you know, 
let's just say it's a, a chemistry maybe that's become popular lately. What what's a common thing that ranchers are doing that uh, is causing some of the biodiversity changes in the cow pie? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the the one thing we know about now is the dewormers, especially ivermectin. Uh, it is it it's been studied enough now. It, it the more ivermectin, uh, the more frequently you apply it, the higher doses the lower the survivability of dung beetles uh, uh, that you're going to have in those cow pads. Now, wait a uh, minute. It's a poron. How is that, how, how is that hurting the manure? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's systemic. It gets in the cow and then it, they actually excrete it out with their manure. So it, there's concentrations of it in, in the manure. So the and, more you do it, the more often you do it, the worse it is. How yep. bad can it be? Uh, I will say this, I've, I've been on some places where they're applying it, you know, twice a year, right before the cows go out onto pasture. And I've never found a place that doesn't have dung beetle activity. Uh, there's always something there. Uh, but just because they're there doesn't mean their larvae are surviving, because uh, they are mobile. They're, they are mobile insects, you know, they can fly anywhere. I've seen uh, some good studies done, you know, three miles. I've heard some people say 10 miles. So they're mobile and they can move into your pasture if they smell that resource out there uh, from a neighbor's. But the trick is keeping them there and then keeping their larva alive to actually break down the dung pads for you. Hmm. What was that stat you were telling me the other day about the wormer? How much money you could save? Oh yes. I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so that study where we were looking at the dung arthropods out there, uh, I pulled some samples from the dung, and uh, just because I was curious about some of the internal parasites, because a lot of our our regenerative farmers used far significantly less poron and uh, uh, dewormers uh, than the than the more conventional continuous graze ranchers did. And we looked at, you know, two of the parasites, coccidia and some, this trichostrongulus group. And we found no difference between our two management styles in terms of parasites coming out of the cat in the cattle sample, the dung samples, excuse me. Uh, and they're both really low. So in terms of managing for parasites, both systems were doing their job. The difference was the conventional farmers, you know, on average were paying five times as much to get that control as a regenerative farmer. And so it was, the difference was like 60 cents per head for a regenerative one versus $3 and 32 cents, which doesn't seem like a lot. And it's not a lot for a year, but when you extrapolate that over the lifetime of your branch, it's about $10,000 and then the other interesting thing we found in this study was the vet bills were actually seven times higher in our conventionally managed ranches than a regeneratively managed one. And that got to be some serious dollars. If you extrapolate that out 30 to 40 years, you know, that's anywhere from $45,000 to $70,000 that you're saving. Uh, so, yeah, I guess whatever. I don't know where I was going with that, but I thought that was just a really interesting segment of how our dewormers and, and those choices that we're making not only affect dung beetles out there, but they also affect our bottom line. So there's a reason to sell uh, the need to take a poron or ivermectin or, or those kind of things, because when they sell it, they, you know, there's some profit made on the product sale, but mm -hmm. there's, there's not a whole lot of people selling the hey, let's increase our resting times mm -hmm. in order to naturally, um, essentially, I don't have a better way to say it, uh, correct me if, if this is wrong, but we're naturally deworming that pasture by not allowing them access to a host for a period of time. Therefore, if they don't have a host in, in the cattle, they can't, their life cycle's broken and, and they mm -hmm. can't can't reproduce. Is that a, is that a fair way to say it? That so either we add chemistry, let them have the whole field, or we mm -hmm. don't add chemistry and we just give them a portion of the field out on a regular basis to where they are restricted access for a period of time to where the, mm -hmm. 
the host isn't present and the the pathogen goes away is that exactly yeah yeah you're you're, you're breaking the life cycle in that regenerative system of the parasites. They can only survive outside of their hosts for, for so long. Uh, and the longer you do that, the more of a chance they have of dying from you know, dehydrating or, or whatever, whatever their life cycle is. Right. And you can't just simply quit using that chemistry. You have to replace it with something else. And that's what that movement of those herds is doing. Right. So I want to back up now and, and look at... Um... The, the bigger picture of, of what you're doing there and what the rest of the team is doing there. How many people know we right now today are living in the greatest extinction event on planet earth? Do you think if you were to, you know, walk down the street, like uh, one of the late night TV show guys do and, and ask people, or they tend to find the really crazy people. But if you were to ask people, how many people you think know that? Man, that's a really good question. I would say not that many. <laughs> and then one, even then, how many of them? Yeah. yeah. How many of them even believe you if you said that? So talk to us about this. This we are living in the greatest extinction event in, in as far as we know in recorded history through what is this the sixth or seventh major extinction event on planet Earth? I, I forget. I we you should know, know that. <laughs> and anyway, talk to us about what does that mean? What is going on? So I've got a stat right here for that. Um, I've got an estimated of about 40% of invertebrate pollinators are at, ri at risk of extinction worldwide right now. So what, that's 40%. Invertebrate pollinator, what, what does that mean? It's a pollinator that does not have a vertebra. So we've got anything, you know, we've got bugs, we've got um, flies, uh, beetles, you know insects generally. And, and I think for a lot of people, they don't realize it's, there's more than honeybees that pollinate. Yeah. I think we're very ignorant of insects. Okay. As, as a population, it, what we know about insects is they're in my house. I want to kill them. You know, that's, yep. that's, that's, that's our mentality with insects, but how many different species out there pollinate? Do you happen to know that off the top of your head? I mean, thousands of species probably are participate in in plant pollination so i've got about 3600 species of native bees um, pollinate in the u.s and canada and that's just the bees um, and so bees are they're only more efficient pollinators than flies and um, beetles and such because they pick up the pollen on their on their hairy little bee bodies but <laughs> there really are um, way more species than just bees that pollinate so and if you try to put like a monetary value on this, I mean, I, I already think that's really, really hard to do because it's a huge service. You know, it's your entire ecosystem that's providing this for you, you know. And 40% of those are at on risk of being gone. Of extinction. Yep. Never coming back. Yep. Oh, and and um, how do we get people to care about it? How do we get people to care about insects to be like red alert? This is a problem. What we're doing in totality is going to affect us more than, or do people not connect the, the effects of insects on, on, on themselves? That, oh, that's a good question. That's the one we're all trying to figure out because we haven't figured it out yet. And I think uh, when I was in grad school, there was an education teacher that told me, because uh, we have all this science to show, you know, this is what insects do for you. Here's all the benefits, yada, yada, yada. You know, there's, for one pest, there's 1,700 beneficial benign insects. People just roll their eyes when, I, when we tell them that often. Uh, and this education instructor told me, if people trust you, the science doesn't matter. If people don't trust you, the science still doesn't matter. And so, you know, what she is saying is it comes down to building trust with folks. And that's where we need a lot of help from farmers and ranchers and, and local folks, you know, using their relationships uh, with their family and friends that trust them to get the word out about a lot of this. Uh, because we cannot be everywhere talking to everyone, building that trust with everybody across the country. Um, 
there was a great extension um, talk uh, from an extension person in Michigan uh, where she found in a survey, it took at least uh, or on average seven face-to-face -face communications with an individual before they would actually make a change. You know, before they had built the, enough trust with this person that that person would make a change and adopt something new. Uh, and so I think that's what it comes down to, and we need help from folks. Uh, so, so hopefully your listeners take some of this to heart and go out into their community and talk to people that they know. So if you think about our field days, when we go out sampling across the country, we have a field day usually, you know, you were at the one in California, and then we had, uh, we have some in Kansas and stuff. That's seven years, because <laughs> we do those once a year, so seven face-to-face -face interactions. We really need those people that are there on the ground to be talking to each other and working with each other on this. I think another, another thing we can really work toward is just a basic education about insects, because a lot of people, they're kind of just taught fear in general to begin with. We've got fleas, we've got ticks, we've got all these nasty like mosquitoes, they all bite, they're disease carrying, I'm scared of them. But then I, I really see once they start to actually learn about the, the insects themselves and spiders especially, people learn about spiders and they start to, you know, they kind of start to appreciate them. And I think a lot of that is just like a lack of understanding uh, of their, their own little bug lives, you know? <laughs> So I think that's something we can definitely work toward. When I was an intern in college, I was at Case Corporation up in Racine, Wisconsin, that makes the red tractors. And I was there in their training department. And, you know, I was the guy that got to set up the tables and, you know, all the lowly intern stuff. Um, and I, I got to sit in on the training sessions, though. And one of them was a, um, a trainer. I'll never forget her. Um, uh, and, and, and she said, people buy emotionally and justify their decisions rationally. When I heard that, I thought, that is the biggest crock of crap I have ever heard. I don't believe that. No way. You know, people are buying because it's more horsepower and it's more, you know, more data, data, data. I can get more acres per hour. I can, I can do this. And however, now... <laughs> you know, 30 years later, I, I have come to the conclusion she is, she is dead on. So you're providing the science, right? We have the science. We know the extinction problem. We know ivermectin is a problem. We know neonics are a problem. I mean, we know there's several other causal agents, but we don't even need to go there. If we, if we could get the ivermectin out of our animals, out of, and if we could get the, um, if we could get the uh, neonics out of our seed treatments, we would make some, some great, great progress. But the problem is we've been sold on the emotion of fear. Like you mentioned, Tia, uh, we're sold on the fear of, Ooh, what happens if my reproduction goes down on my cattle? What happens if my yield goes down on my corn? And I think, um, we, we need to look at it from the standpoint of what if you're causing problems in your soil by doing ivermectin? What if you're causing to uh, bad genetic selection within your cattle because you're using ivermectin? What if the neonics you're using on the corn is causing your slug problem? What if the neonics you're using is transferring into kernels that you're feeding to people downstream? All of that is happening. You know, so every decision has a consequence. And I think if we can tie into that emotion better, because you guys have done the science, right? Or better yet is tie into what's the alternative? Okay, well, great. You don't want me to use ivermectin. How do I do it? Oh, great. You don't want me to have neonic. Because I think a conventional farmer hears the regenerative crowd as the no, you can't do anything crowd. And they want to regulate everything and, and tell me I can't do this. I can't do this. Can't do this. Cause there's tools in the toolbox, the conventional farmer, they've come very comfortable with and it's made life easier. So, you know, what is the alternative, which we try to ag solutions network provide? What is the alternative? And secondly, what, how do we overcome that fear? How is the fear of what you're doing greater than the fear of what you're thinking about doing. Mm -hmm. So 
how have how have you guys addressed that? How have you addressed what is the alternative? And how have you addressed um, the fear of what I'm doing is greater than the fear of what I should be doing? I'm going to let Ryan talk about this a little bit in a minute, but I think something I want to say is um, we we really, I don't want to sell fear and I don't want to say that this is the lesser of two evils. You know, maybe you should be more afraid of this <laughs> than you are afraid of that. I think a really big part of regenerative agriculture is working with the ecosystems that already exist. So instead of running away from something, you're actually building something new. So um, this is this is a different type of mindset, you know, than, than how farmers generally think about their ecosystems. So instead of trying to kill all the bugs, maybe we're trying to encourage beneficials. So we're actually trying to reinforce and build a natural system that's already working. And it's already worked for thousands, millions of years, you know? That's a great answer to you. I really appreciate that. And Ryan, she, she left you on the hook. You... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like you said. How do we overcome the fear of change, essentially? I, that's the fear I was referring to, Tia, not that. You know, there's, so the fear of change, you know, it brings risk. It, there's risk involved in changing because of the unknown potential. But I would, I would argue our current conventional, you know, what we're calling conventional here in this context is, is also risky. There's risk to staying the same. And that should be a little bit fearful to folks. Uh, I, I see an expiration, I, you know, I come from a farming background. So I grew up on a farm. Uh, we were a small cow, cow calf operation. We had some row crop fields and I don't knock people that are still doing it. Uh, it, it got us to where we're at. We produce an awful lot of food very efficiently. But when you look at some of the numbers, uh, you know, there's a cost associated with what we've been able to do. And it looks like there's an expiration date to how long we're going to be able to do that. And that means there's a risk to continually doing that uh, and not figuring out something, something different. Uh, right now, we're looking at regenerative very hard because it looks promising to us. So yes, there's, re there's risk to changing to regenerative, but I would argue there's risk to staying in the same spot and degrading your soils because when you do need to take that change, when we do run out of affordable fertilizers, uh, other inputs, you're gonna be behind the eight ball of people that have already adopted some of these other soil health practices. I couldn't agree more. And uh, a lot of things while we're helping farmers make those adaptations today, is to try it on a small portion of their acres to where they can learn and optimize the system for their environment in order to expand it to the rest of their operation so that they're ahead of the inevitable uh, eight ball, as you would say. And I, I see if they can make an informed decision and, and be uh, ahead of that curve, they're going to be able to uh, adapt into a new model much easier and much less pain than somebody that's all of a sudden forced to do it, maybe against their will, all at once. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's a great, great point. And um, both of you, you summarize the, uh, uh, the challenges that are ahead of it very, very well and, and very well said. And, and I, I'm with you. I, I, don't, I agree with you. Farmers aren't doing things uh, intentionally bad. Uh, we've been given tools that we were taught were safe and or easier to handle. I mean, the whole neonic came out because it's safer for the person, right? You know, then anophosphate, you know, uh, how, how do you know if you uh, have, um, you know, organophosphates are just plain deadly to people and, mm -hmm. and thought we were doing the right thing switching. And now we're learning, oh, there's long-term soil persistence and, and these kind of other issues. Um, but I, I appreciate that. And what, one final note I wanted to ask you about, we're, we're familiar with the neonics and, and their effect on the larger insect community. Um, there's a half-life to them and they're present in the soil and can be present in the soil and uptake. And you, you guys have done work on it, uptake in the sunflower up to five years after the previous seed treatment applied. Um, what is the documented persistence and how do we detox our soils? Is there any work that's been done in other than just letting time? Is there something we can do 
uh, product wise or rotation wise in order to help detox them from our soils? So I think the, the general idea right now is that uh, neonics can stay in the soil for three years plus. Um, say so that that's what I, you say three or 30? Three. Three, okay. So three years, years. 20 years. yeah, 20, up to 20 is what Ryan is saying. Yeah, depending right on, you know, if the sun's hitting it and breaking it down, is the water flushing it out? You know, there's, there's environmental. And these are from seed treatment, right? Not from broadcast sprays. Yeah. This is like Neonic, so uh, Poncho, Cruiser, I can say these registered trademarks, sorry folks, but that's what they are, right? And and we've gone, when I, I remember when I first started getting Poncho, it was Poncho 250, which refers to the rate you know, mm -hmm. then it shortly thereafter has become Poncho 1250. And then it okay. was, and then there's additional chemistry. So we're getting higher and higher rates and higher, and higher um, active ingredient effect um, F, or powerfowlness, if you will. <laughs> Sorry for yeah. the wrong word. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so all this is just based on what's on that seed. How is that possible? I don't know. It, it's designed to be a persistent chemistry that's systemic throughout a plant. So, you know, if, if you're designing a chemical, I guess I don't know the, you know, chemically how it's persisting out there. But. but that seed treatment I put on the corn this year, if I planted a cover crop of sunflower or, or a sunflower crop the next year, you can detect that neonic from the corn in the nectar generated by the sunflower the subsequent year. Is that correct? Yeah, it stays in the soil and then it's mm -hmm. taken back up into the plants. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, like, how do we get this out of the soil? I think probably your first step is obviously just to stop doing it. <laughs> right. You're actually trying to get rid of it. If you, if you burn your hand and it hurts and then you keep holding it <laughs> there and it keeps burning it, it's, it's not going to get better. It's not going to heal. <laughs> so <laughs> once, once we've stopped, stopped applying it, um, I think another thing that really helps cycle these out is um, the soil chemistry itself. So we do know that moisture helps break down um, neonics. Uh, sunlight helps to break down neonics. Um, so I don't want to encourage you to go out and till, but that is something to keep in mind that um, these natural processes kind of are going to break it down eventually. So probably the most important thing and the most beneficial thing you can do is to just stop using them. <laughs> if you're trying to get rid of them, just stop using them. And increase your diversity out there. You know, if it's uptaken by a plant, it's in the plant, and then the plant eventually dies if you crimp it or, or you, however you, you, whatever you use to kill that cover crop plant off, you know, it's then sitting inside of a plant that's going to be on top of the soil, breaking down the sun sign. Yeah, so, the or being recycled by micro, you know, you can cycle it through something else that's alive out there, microbes, fungi, that sort of thing. Yeah, these oh. biological processes are breaking it down. Very good. So if we can have higher biomass cover crops that could extract it from the soil, bring it up into the foliage, and then it, it dies and essentially radiated, right, by UV light, that's, that's one method at this time. Uh, other than yeah. that, just stop and, and wait. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cycle it through your system. Well, we've certainly, we've certainly covered a lot of poop today. <laughs> not nearly and, and as we, much as ryan wanted yeah <laughs> oh oh what, so let me let me uh <laughs> no, no, no. is there is you there anything that i should have asked that i didn't that's a question i like to end with what else should i have brought up today that i that i failed to do <laughs> something i wanted to talk to you oh man well I don't know if we have enough time to talk about all my poop comments uh, with with livestock. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess one thing I, I would say is we didn't talk too much about the regenerative principles of you know high stocking density, frequent herd rotations, adequate rest for the paddocks that the herd is moving off of, you know, allowing the plant community to regrow, and then reducing or eliminating your um, dewormers and other insecticides, herbicides on that land. Uh, so those are our four principles. And I would say you can't just do, you know, they're designed to work together in concert uh, and build off of one another and really uh, um, help each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and that being said, you also just can't expect to, you know, maybe stop using your 
dewormers and, and it, but not do the rest of it uh, and expect that to magically keep your parasites down. Um, it, they're all designed to work together. And so that's something, I don't want somebody to go out there and try this uh, after just hearing, I can eliminate my dewormers and nothing of that will happen uh, because you will have a train wreck. So you, you, you have to kind of understand the biological system that's, that's happening. I would encourage folks to do, do a little bit more research before they, they try it and, and then it fails on them and then they never try it again. Uh, I, I would hate for that to happen. But just go try it. <laughs> yeah, correct. Don't don't know. don't uh, don't not try. So <laughs> yeah, uh, very very good point. Well, I certainly appreciate your time today, and I, I think we've covered a lot of things. And uh, it, it is interesting that that interaction between having grazing ruminants in order to support healthy bee colonies. So in those areas where we can you know, have the bees uh, rest and recover from the almond bloom in California and, and having a diverse, a healthy source because uh, just accepting 45% loss in honeybees every year is, is just not acceptable, uh, especially if that continues to increase. And um, I think there's, there's a lot, everybody, you know, several, a large percentage of our food requires pollinators, both native and um, honeybees to to make our food available to us. So the work that you're doing there and looking at this holistic systems approach between rangeland, uh, diversity, quality driven by arthropods and, and uh, you know, the manure being evenly distributed, all that work that you're doing, Ryan, to, you know, and on making the bees happy and healthy, then the work that Tia is doing, that's a great uh, systems approach to, to solving a very, very big problem. So thank you for all the hard work you're doing. I. Uh, we we all appreciate it because we all eat every day. Thank you. So take care and and uh, we look to stay tuned with with all that you're doing and um, we'll post links to your your work in the podcast notes and and looking forward to uh, changing those minds even though it takes seven times. I'm sure it takes a little more than that. <laughs> we're going to change the minds one at a time. So thank you for your time today. That's thank great. you. Thank you. Add passion and purpose to the pollinators, pastures, and poop discussion. It's folks like Ryan and Tia and all the researchers at Exisis that are helping us to uncover and understand all of these different communities through, as they say, their cutting-edge research for transforming agriculture with regenerative principles. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers implement soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.